Tonight we're in chapter 9 here in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 28. So let me read to you, beginning at verse 16, read to verse 28, and we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 16. The writer writes there, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it is since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, uh, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And so Jesus Christ is the one who comes to give to us a better covenant based on better promises. And Jesus as a high priest has made the perfect sacrifice. Jesus made the perfect sacrifice when he gave himself up for us. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so as we look at the New Testament, the New Testament conveys to us the understanding that the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yes and amen. All things are fulfilled by him. And so you have in the Old Testament a picture of sacrifice and the daily offerings that would be made. And then that great sacrifice, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that would be made. And in the daily sacrifice and yearly sacrifice, you have a remembrance of sins. Your conscience is never cleansed. Because in the continuation of the offerings, there is also a reminder of the fact that you aren't right before God. But God did something in the New Testament, and what he did was he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' coming for us to rescue us, to lay his life down for us, Jesus Christ demonstrates the great love of God for us and how far God was willing to go in order to redeem us. I was reading a, a story that is purportedly a true story that spoke to my heart concerning a naval SEAL team that was dispatched to do a, a rescue mission. There were certain hostages that had been held as hostages for some time, and they had discovered the location and sent a team in order to rescue them. And so they got into the compound where these uh, prisoners were being held. And as, as is the way they do things, they burst into the, uh, the room where the prisoners were being held. But as they burst into the room, all the noise and all of the confusion, all the sounds and smells that were occurring at that time had caused the prisoners to be exceedingly terrorized. And so when the team got into the room there, they, they searched the room for the people, and there they were. But they were all huddled together in a corner. And so the naval team yelled out to them, We're Americans. We've come to rescue you. Come and follow us. But they wouldn't move. They just remained paralyzed there in fear. And they stayed that way for some time. And because time is of the essence, they didn't know what to do because there were too many people being held hostage for this small extraction team to be able to take them out, to carry them out individually. These people had to get up on their feet, and they had to follow them out. And even though they yelled out, we are Americans, we've come to rescue you, come with us, follow us, they wouldn't follow them. And so one of the team members there got an idea, and he removed his helmet. 
And when he removed his helmet, he actually went and crawled up next to this, this group of people that were huddled in fear, their eyes being closed. And he huddled next to them for a moment. And as he was there next to them, he made contact with them, even reached over and began to just soothe. And as he did so, one of the people who were being held hostage opened their eyes. And when he opened his eyes, the man looks at him, the, the SEAL member looks at him, and he says, we're Americans, we've come to rescue you, follow us. And the, the SEAL commander stood to his feet, and, and when he did so, the person he spoke to stood to his feet also. And then all of them stood to their feet and followed him out, and they were able to rescue them, took him to an aircraft carrier and brought him home. And what I found interesting about that was the picture, obviously, that we have of Jesus Christ that we are huddled in a corner afraid. We've been terrorized and, and misused, abused by this world. But Jesus came and said, I've come to rescue you. And when he came into the room to rescue us, because we weren't expecting him in that way, we became afraid. We were already afraid, and the noise and confusion of, of our lives kept us in a, in a corner huddled. But Jesus actually got down next to us. He embraced us, spoke to us in a language that we could understand and he brought us to a place of being rescued. That's what Jesus Christ did. When you have in the Old Testament pictures of the law and the covenants, you have all of the various offerings, the sacrifices that were being made and all. Those things were all partial. They were not complete. But Jesus Christ has come in order that he might completely save us. Remember in verse 12, how here in chapter 9 of Hebrews, uh, that the writer said, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place Place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Well, he was pointing out that Jesus' blood is superior to the blood of sacrificial animals, those that he refers to as goats and calves. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so Jesus' blood is more capable of cleansing and Jesus' blood actually brings the desired result, which is the cleansing of our conscience. You see, animals could have an exterior physical uh, appearance of perfection, but Jesus is perfect spiritually, morally, in every, in every way. And the blood of Christ is more effective because it actually cleanses your conscience from dead works. Your conscience can be clean through Jesus Christ. There are so many people that... that have such guilty consciences because of the things they've done in the past. They can hardly live with themselves. Though it's interesting to me to note that there are some who don't have guilt at all. It appears that they have no conscience whatsoever. Their conscience, though, may excuse them, but in reality, because they have sinned against God, though they may have a conscience that to them is clean, in reality, before God, it is still impure, it is still dirty. The fact is, we all need to be cleansed. We all need our consciences cleansed by the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned this to you before, but you know that old saying, well, you Christians are brainwashed, and the answer is absolutely. My brains were dirty, and I needed to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's what happens is the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us in a perfect way, and now our conscience is clean before the Lord Jesus Christ. And so according to verse 15, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. So in the Old Testament, a person who was in need of salvation and uh, in needed to be cleansed uh, would be cleansed by faith in the one who was to come. We, in the New Testament period, are cleansed by the one who has already come. The Old Testament was looking forward to Jesus. The New Testament, we look back to the things that he has done. The Old Testament saints, in other words, we're saved, if you will, on credit. So for us, we know that salvation is an accomplished act. In the book of Acts, in chapter 16, there's an interesting story there concerning the apostle Paul and, and one of his traveling companions, a man by the name of Silas. They entered into the city called Philippi, and while they were there, they began to minister. While there was a young woman who was following them around, she was a person who was a, a diviner. She would prophesy under the influence of an evil spirit, and she continued to follow them around for some time. And as this young woman would uh, follow them around, she was saying something like, uh, these are, are, you know, men come from God, and they're going to show you the way of salvation. And, and after she did that for several days, the Bible says that Paul became greatly annoyed. 
and he turned and he cast the demon out of this woman. Well, that wasn't something that everybody appreciated because she actually had brought revenue to an individual and he was upset because he lost his source of income. So as a result of that, he made accusation against Paul and Silas and ultimately were taken, they were in prison and they were beaten. As they were there in this Philippian uh, prison there, in this jail cell, and as they've been uh, beaten and as they've been treated in the way that they had, yet the Scripture says at midnight they began to sing praises unto the Lord. And God actually enacted a release, an escape for them. And so he released all the prisoners. He, he took their, their, the, the, the cell doors and opened them up. And, and so the Philippian jailer who was there in charge of uh, making sure the prisoners were uh, not able to escape, when he saw the doors were open, got exceptionally afraid, and he actually took out his weapon and was about to kill himself. But the apostle Paul said, do yourself no harm. And when he began to speak to this man, the man asked him a question. The man said to him and to Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer came from Paul, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And so the promise of salvation comes through a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. And we are saved by looking back at the cross, how that Jesus fulfilled all of God's righteous requirements found in the law of Moses. And when he died on that cross, he took upon himself our sin, our penalty, and in doing so, we by faith are saved and justified in relationship to him and with God. And so that's what we're looking at tonight as we move into verse 16. Because he continues here and he says, uh, where there is a testament, there, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. If a man has a will, the will does not become effective until the person who drew up the will dies. That's when it becomes effective. And so I have a living trust. And so... You know, it's not effective to my kids. My kids can't begin to spend the money that they didn't earn yet. They're going to be spending that after their father dies, actually after their mom dies because uh, anything I have goes to Marie, and then she's going to party it. Anyway, uh, but anything that's left over from her is going to go to the kids. That's how wills and living trusts work. It, 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 they become effective after the person who drew it up actually dies. And so that's what he's referring to here when he says in verse 16, where there is a testament, there must also be of necessity be uh, the death of the testator, the one who drew up that will. So provisions of a normal will are enforced when that person dies. In verse 18, therefore not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded to you. Now, you find that in Exodus chapter 24. God has given the law to Moses. Moses has been there on Mount Sinai. And as God has given to him the, the ten words, the Decalogue, the ten commandments, as God has given him those words, Moses is about to give those words to the people. And as, as, as God has done this work, Moses is there at that mountain. And as he begins to share with the people what God has said, according to Exodus 24, 3, the Bible says, after Moses gave God's commands, Israel responded, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And so there was an agreement, an agreement that the people of Israel made. They had stated, whatever God says is fine with me. I will do everything that he has, he has said. And so after he has done that, and the next morning, he erected an altar. He also had 12 pillars. And there he began to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings. And he collected the blood from these sacrifices. According to Exodus 24, 6, Moses took half of the blood and he put it in basins. And the other half he sprinkled on the altar. And next he begins to read to them uh, from the book in which were written the terms of the covenant. And again, the people stated that they would accept its obligations. At that point, Moses took the remaining blood and he sprinkled it on the people and in doing so instituted the covenant. In Exodus 24, 8, it says, Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And so the Lord actually symbolically is covering them. In the Old Testament, the blood is a temporary, it's a picture of covering, but it's not complete and it's not perfect. That doesn't occur until Jesus Christ dies. 
Now he goes on and he says in verse 21, likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And so after the tabernacle has been built, later on in the history of Israel, once again the tabernacle is consecrated to God. According to Exodus 29, 12, God said, take some of the bull's blood, put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, pour out the rest at the base of the altar. And so he's just pointing out that, that the people, the law, and the utensils, the tabernacle, everything is basically covered by blood. So in verse 22, according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. The purpose of the blood is to symbolize sacrifice for sin, which results in cleansing. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. According to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the life of a creature is in the blood. I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. You see, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin or the penalty of sin is death. And therefore, nothing less than death, symbolized by the shedding of blood, can atone for sin. The bottom line is, is forgiveness is costly. Forgiveness is costly. When I was about 24 years old, half, you know, many years ago now, when I was 24 years old, I was talking to one of my uh, professors at Biola. And um, I had become disillusioned with Christianity. I'd become disillusioned with the Christian life. And it's kind of odd because I was teaching Bible studies at that time, going to Bible college at that time. I actually had as a life's desire to be a pastor someday. And, and I thought that by going to Biola, that would be something that, and it was, something that the Lord would use to put me in a position of one day serving Him as I am today. But I had gone through a time of disillusionment, a season of disillusionment. And I was speaking to my professor, and I remember speaking to him and saying that I was having a difficult time. And he said something to me that I've never forgotten. All these years later, I still remember what he said to me as we were speaking. And he was sharing with me concerning the fact that forgiveness is costly. And he said to me, David, he says, you know, after all, uh, you need to learn to forgive, is what he said. And, and uh, after all, he said, God has forgiven you. God has forgiven you. And I remember looking at him saying, he has to, that's his job. My attitude at that time was, it was easy for God to forgive. And you want to know something? I suspect that there are people today who still have that kind of attitude, that it was easy for God to forgive. It was easy for him to do that. You know, it's no secret that I love my children. And it's no secret I'm a family man. That's the truth, and I thank God for it. And there's no secret that I love my grandson Josiah with every bit of my heart. That's the truth, and everybody who knows me knows that for sure. And as I hold him, even as I did today after service and before services this morning, he came into the office to see Grandpa. And it's kind of funny that nobody knows this, of course, unless you're standing there. But after third service, when I walk and I say, God bless you, and I'll see you tonight, and I walk through that door there, and I go into the back, and I go into my office. As I started to walk into my office, I open the door up, and standing right there at the door is my grandson, just standing there, puts his arms up. The minute I open the door, you know, Grandpa, Papa. He didn't call me Grandpa, Papa, and he jumps into my arms. And then for the next until, you know, I deliver him to his mama to take home, to get, you know, to take him home to feed him or whatever, he's in my arms, basically. And he's three years old. You know, he's not an infant anymore. He's growing up. And yet, I have to tell you, you know, I'll carry him around and I'll hold him and I'll sit him on my lap and he puts his head on my shoulder. And if you try to take him out of my arms, he puts his arms down like this so that you can't reach him. I put my arms around him. He even puts his hands out to his grandmother, whom he calls Mama, to Marie and puts and says, no, you know, you, he said this, you can go away, I just want Papa. And that's what he does. And so naturally, you know, he's, he's a very wise kid, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> He's made some good choices, but you know, you know, he, he is my heart in, in every way. This is the way my kids are. And, and you know, I, I know this may be a little, mel a little melodramatic to some in this room, and perhaps you might not even believe this to be true, though it is. Uh, I, on time, on, uh, many times, the Lord has spoken to my heart about his love for me, and he has done that through my children. And he has done that now through my grandson. 
And, and it's very simple. It's just as I hold and as I, and I, and I kiss him and, and I'll just embrace and just, and I really do just hold on to him as if he's just a baby still. As I hold him like that in my arms, there have been times the Lord says, do you know how deeply you love this little boy? Could you imagine giving him up, not just for people who, whom you may love, but giving him up for those who, who hate him, who would never want anything to do with him. And, and I actually think that way, and I think, of course not. I couldn't in, in a moment, for, for a moment, conceive of yielding one of the, my children's lives up for, for people who, who, who would not appreciate or, or people who, who would even hate. And yet that's what God did, and he illustrates that to me. He illustrates that through, through the love that he has given to me for, for my wife and for my children and for my grandson. And, and so, no, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for God to just yield Jesus up. Uh, he yielded up his son, and Jesus shed his blood for us, and salvation is costly. Sin is horrible, and God hates it, and it separates man from God, and there's an eternal penalty because of it. And, and that eternal penalty is separation for eternity in a place called hell. And God, in order to rescue us from that place, paid a price that is exquisite, is a price that is beyond anything we can imagine. It was the life of his own son, and that's the point that he's making. He's pointing out that the Lord God gave his son in order that Jesus Christ might die on the cross to save us because forgiveness is costly. He says in verse 23, therefore, it was, uh, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So notice what he's saying. He's making it very clear that Christ has, has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are only copies of the true. He, in other words, is in the actual presence of God. If the question is asked, where is Jesus? Well, the Bible's answer would be he's in the presence of God. He's in the actual presence, not in an earthly tabernacle, which was only a copy. When Jesus was speaking on one occasion, he said, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, he said, I leave the world and go unto the Father. So Jesus Christ, they're seated at the right hand of his Father. In 1 Peter 3, the Bible says, Jesus has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. In Hebrews, we read in chapter 7, verse 25, he is able to save them to the uttermost who come to God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. So the Lord Jesus Christ is before his Father in the presence of God on our behalf. Jesus Christ is our defense attorney, pleading our cause before the Lord. Jesus, our defense attorney, is pleading our cause because we, haven't, we have somebody who is our opponent, and his name is Satan. And Satan will make uh, statements concerning us, and, and to be honest with you, many times the statements that Satan would make concerning us are true. He could, you know, in a picture he could say to God, there's, there's David, he's claiming to be a pastor, but look, he's not very kind at all. Look at how he just spoke to his wife, or look at the attitude that he has, or, or, or watch the way that he really is. And, and, and he could point my faults out before God the Father very easily because the Scripture says he accuses the brethren both night and day. And that's what he is. He's the accuser. He does the same for you too. None of us in this room, though we may be deceived into thinking we're perfect, none of us are. There's, you know, there's a doctrine today called sinless perfectionism. It's been around for a long time. It's been part of the holiness movement. It's been part of the church of God, and, and it's part of, uh, of the Wesleyan theology. I mean, it's been around for a couple hundred years where you can actually be sinless and perfect, at least in your mentality you are. And, and what happens is people begin to think that they are sinless and they aren't perfect in, in actual practice, when in reality what we are, we've been made cleansed by the blood of Jesus before God, and we are there in that position. Positionally, we are cleansed. Actually, we're going through cleansing. Because positionally, before God, I right now stand in the righteousness of Christ. But in actuality, I live a life that still, uh, I, it still falls short of the glory of God. 
And so the enemy could point and say, look at this person here. He's, he's not what he appears to be. He's, he's not 100% he's not perfect. And, and, and that's the truth. But you see, he's accusing me, but I have somebody who defends me, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus stands before the Father and says, that one belongs to me. That one is washed by my blood. And he's there before the Lord making intercession on my behalf. And so that happened when he died on the cross, when he was buried, resurrected, ascended, and he's now there seated at the right hand of God. And that's the point that's being made. He's not in a copy. He is in the real. And, and he is appearing before the presence of God for us. In verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Uh, he's in heaven. It demonstrates that sin has been dealt with forever. And Jesus fulfilled the entire ritual of the Day of Atonement in his death on the cross. Uh, since since uh, uh, sin has been a problem since Adam and Eve. So if Jesus' offering was not completely satisfying, then out of necessity he'd have to be sacrificed often. But the fact is, Jesus' death on that cross was a perfect offering, one time for all time. And so all God had to do is send his son one time. Jesus died one time, and that sacrifice is something that has been for us for all time. When he says in verse 26, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The end of the ages is the consummation of the ages, and that occurred on Calvary because Calvary is the focus of redemptive history. And notice in verse 26, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Who killed Jesus Christ? Sometimes in the history of the church, those who have called themselves Christian have blamed Jewish people. And they have said, the Jews killed Christ. Others would say, now wait a minute, he died under Roman law. Though he was accused by the Jewish nation, yet it was the Romans who put him to death on the cross, therefore the Romans. But what you have there is you have Jew and you have Gentile and you have equal guilt before God, meaning that we put Jesus on that cross. Jesus didn't die for his own sin because Jesus never sinned. Jesus died on behalf of sinners. And what he did is he took our place. So Jesus put an end to sin by the sacrifice of himself. The debt is completely paid over when Jesus died on the cross. There are, uh, in the New Testament Gospels, there are recorded at the end of uh, the Gospels what are called the seven last sayings of Jesus Christ. And when you read some of the comments that he made, you know, um, you will see that one of the comments he made or one of the statements he made was simply, it is finished. When Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he actually was using a word that people would understand by, by the statement, paid in full. There are those, unfortunately, who say that salvation was won in hell. And there are, some, there are some who have picked up a fictitious story that Jesus Christ went to hell and, and that he was being tortured by Satan and because there was some kind of loophole in the covenant, Satan didn't understand that Jesus actually fully redeemed us in hell and then came out victorious. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that when Jesus was on the cross, that he said, it is finished. When he said, it is finished, it is paid in full. Now, I'm somebody who on occasion has bills. I don't like bills. I try to pay cash for everything that I get. I know I, have, I couldn't pay cash for my house. I couldn't pay, can't pay cash for a car, so I make payments on them. But mostly, normally, I try to just pay cash for whatever it is that I buy because I just don't like paying interest on things. I'm just not one who likes to pay long-term and give people a whole lot of money. And so over time... You know, as you're paying, though, and I've done it on occasion, what you end up getting is a statement, and the statement will come to you, and it'll basically say, paid in full. You know, I'm not one of these who will say, well, I've been paying $50 a month for so long, I'll just keep sending them $50. 
I'm somebody who will take the paid in full statement and I rejoice over it. I dance over it. It's paid in full. It belongs to me. And then it normally breaks right after that. But anyway, it says paid in full on that. Well, salvation is something that is paid in full. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid in full my debt. And so I can't add to that. See, the works of righteousness that I perform cannot in any way, shape, or form help me to be saved. I can try all day long to be good, but the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. The only sacrifice that God is willing to accept is a perfect one, and not a single person that's ever lived outside of Jesus Christ can make a perfect sacrifice. Every sacrifice that I've ever done before I was a Christian, everything I've ever done when I've said, well, this is for God, was really tainted with self-interest because I was trying to somehow get into his favor by doing something, perhaps praying or maybe a good deed or whatever that is. But when I got saved, I got saved because I came to realize something. I got saved because I heard the gospel, and the gospel said that my debt is paid in full by Jesus Christ. So it's not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me by the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's where a lot of people have their problems because before they come to Christ, they may really desire to know God, so they do incredible things. They, they, you know, just recently, there were multiple millions of Hindus who were by the Ganges River, and they camped out all night so that they could step into the waters of the river that they call a goddess so that they might step into that river and that the waters of the Ganges might, might wash their flesh so that they might walk away believing that their path to reincarnation has been, has been guaranteed. And that's a sad reality when we as believers know that God has already accomplished that for us through Jesus Christ. So somebody walks up to an evangelist. This evangelist had recently been doing some ministry in his town, and the young man approaches the evangelist and says to him, um, what can I do to be saved? And as the evangelist was about to climb in his car to drive out of town, the, the series of revivals being finished, the evangelist turns to the young man and he says, I'm sorry, son, you're too late. And the, the boy looks at him and he says, I'm too late? He says, you're too late. Because there's nothing you can do to be saved. It's already been done for you. It's be do been done through Jesus Christ. And what you need to do is simply believe him. This is an interesting passage. It's just a couple of scriptures. It's found in the Gospel of John in chapter 6. But it's interesting to me because in John chapter 6, Jesus has done an amazing thing. He has fed a multitude of people, several thousand. He has taken some bread and some fish, and he's multiplied the loaves of bread and the fish to the extent that he is able to, to uh, serve many thousands of people with just a few articles. And, and it's such an incredible thing that the people begin to just be amazed by that, and, and they, they want to follow him, and, 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 they, and they do. And so in, in John chapter 6, verse 25, uh, the Bible says, that Jesus, after he had uh, gotten into a boat and, and went to Capernaum, it says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which, which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. God will give you eternal life in the way that Jesus took the bread and the fish, multiplied and gave it to the people who had no resources to be able to purchase it or to care for themselves. The reason Jesus Christ multiplied the fish and the loaves is because his disciples had said, you need to send them back because they're, you know, we don't have the resources, and Jesus was concerned because they may have fainted along the way. They were hungry, so he decided that, that his disciples needed to learn ministry 101 to minister to these people, and Jesus took in a mir miraculous way, <laughs> multiplied this young boy's lunch to the feeding of many, but he says, you didn't get the point. You don't understand. See, the reason you're here seeking me out is because I fed a physical hunger that you have. I was able to provide for you. But I'm telling you, don't labor for the food which perishes. You could have a great meal, a wonderful meal, 
But ultimately, the meal is over the minute you finish consuming it. It's done. He says, don't labor for those things. Why? Because they don't satisfy. If a meal could really satisfy, all we'd need to do is eat one time. We'd be satisfied for a lifetime. But he says, that's not going to work. What you have to do is you need to have that which, which gives everlasting life. And by the way, he said, the Son of Man will give you this because God the Father has set his seal on him. And the way that I was able to feed with the, the bread and the fish, even so I can meet your spiritual hunger. But they go on to say in verse uh, 28 of John 6, they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And then he gave the answer, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. You want to do something? Believe me. You want to do something to receive life? You want to do something that will satisfy you? You want to have something that will satisfy your spiritual hunger and desires? Believe in me. The word believe means more than just a mental assent to some facts. The word believe means to cling to, to adhere to, hold fast to me, trust in me, rely on me, have full confidence in me, put everything that you have and believe towards me, and you'll have eternal life. The thing that you need is to trust me because, Jesus would say, he's already taken care of the sin debt when he died on the cross for us. And that's what the Scripture is telling us here. He would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Because sin is costly, it cost when Jesus died on the cross. In verse 27, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The Christian belief is not one of multiple opportunities. The Christian faith is an acknowledgement, a reality of the fact that I have one life to live, and therefore, either I give my life to Jesus Christ and enter into eternity through faith in him into the presence of God, or I reject him. But I don't get a second and I don't get a third chance. I mean, there, there are those who believe in reincarnation. Uh, they believe in multiple births and all as they move themselves up to nirvana or some state of bliss. But uh, from my perspective, one, I wouldn't want to come back a second time. Would you? Would you want to come back again? One time's enough for me, to be honest with you. One time's enough. You know, so I don't feel like coming back again. And, and then what if I came back as a worm? I mean, think about it for a minute. I mean, that's probably not the most, you know, you know, hope-filled thing that you can have, that I might come back as a worm or a cow. I mean, I'm not quite sure that I'd like to do that. I think one time is enough. But the Bible teaches that. The Bible teaches that, that there is no such thing as reincarnation. The Bible says it is appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. One time. You don't have a second opportunity. You don't get a new chance. There is no temporary place in between death and entering into eternity called purgatory, where your sins are purged. Your sins have been purged by the blood of Jesus Christ while still alive on earth. And so we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's how it works. And so the Bible is very clear when it says it is appointed unto a man to die but one time. Now, interestingly enough, um, there have been exceptions to that. Uh, you have in the Old Testament a man by the name of Enoch who walked with God and was not for God took him. And, and you see that Elijah was taken in a, a, a fiery chariot into heaven. But the standard is it is appointed unto men to die once, and then you stand before God in what is called the judgment. And as you stand before God, as a Christian, I stand before him uh, at what is called the Bema Seat of Christ, the reward seat, where Jesus issues rewards for service done as unto him. So I stand before him to receive from him as a believer. And as I stand before him, I'm going to receive from him rewards for the things that I've done. Turn with me for just a moment to 1 Corinthians. I want to show you something in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let me illustrate this through Scripture. A believer stands before the Lord Jesus Christ to receive reward. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3... Verse 11, following, 
Paul said, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And so it's a picture of the works that I've done, and as I've done these works, it's like a pile. And the Lord's judgment, like fire, is going to incinerate those things that have been done in the flesh. Even good things that I've done that I thought were great, you know, giving money to the poor or helping some neighbor out in distress, or, or if that was done with a fleshly desire, then the Bible makes it very clear that I have no reward for that. Jesus spoke about that when he said some people stand on street corners and they, and they pray out loud while they receive their reward. Some people give certain things to people. They give alms to the poor and the recognition from other people. That's the reward. And, and some people will fast and it will even disfigure their faces to a appear to man to be fasting. He says, I tell you, from man they receive the reward. You can do religious things like giving and, and, and serving and, and fasting. You can do those things. But if they're done with the wrong intent, then they're wood, hay, and they're stubble. They're burning up when God reviews them. Then there are the other things, the things that are done simply out of pure love for Jesus Christ because I love them and I serve them with all of my heart. And those are the rewards that you receive. Those are the things that endure. Some people are going to enter into heaven, this is true, but they're going to be smoking as they arrive. We've all seen Wile E. Coyote, and there are going to be people like that standing in heaven, I promise you. I, was, I used to work at a place a um, long time ago now um, that had blast furnaces. I think I've shared this with you before. Some of you have heard this, but they had these small blast furnaces. They were actually pressurized containers, and so you, there were heavy metal lids to them, and and there was a long, a long chute. And uh, one of the men who worked there uh, would light these furnaces up. And he had a long rod, and at the end of the rod would be a match. And the match would be used to ignite the gas so that this uh, gas-fueled uh, uh, furnace could be ignited. And, and I remember on one occasion, as he was standing next to one of these furnaces, this big furnace, as he was standing there and as he had turned the gas on, somebody came and spoke to him. And as they spoke to him, uh, he just stood there for, you know, for about a minute. And he's got, the, he's got the thing and he lights it and then he slides this down the tube while the gas had built up and it exploded. And when the, when the, the gas exploded, it actually knocked the door right off the, uh, off the furnace. And it, if it didn't have these uh, safety measures, it would have killed him. It exploded and when it exploded, all of the, uh, the flames escaped from it, and he was standing there. Now, it was like a starter's pistol for me, to be honest with you. When that thing went off, I was out the door. I mean, I was gone. But I remember turning and looking into the room at this man who was still standing at the furnace, and his hair had caught on fire, and there was smoke all over the room. That's how some people are going to enter into heaven. You know? <laughs> we made it, you know. <laughs> I don't want to come in that way. I don't want that to be the way I stand before the Lord. The works that I perform are going to be judged by God. Some people's works, as they do, they receive their rewards. Other people may be relying on their good works, but there's no work a human being can do that is equal to the one work that God has already done, and that is in the giving of a perfect sacrifice, His Son, Jesus Christ. And so back in Hebrews, in concluding, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. I mean, these people who are freezing their bodies, you know, they freeze them in hopes that sometime that they'll be defrosted and come back to life. That's a sad thing because you're more than the flesh. The soul has already departed. And the Bible makes it clear that it is appointed to die once. After this, the judgment, and you stand before God. So, he says in verse 28, Christ was offered once, even as I die once, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That speaks of the second coming. And I want you to notice, he speaks concerning those who eagerly wait for him. Eagerly wait for him. You know that phrase, come quickly, Lord Jesus. 
that anticipation of being with him. The way that a young bride who truly loves the man she's going to marry looks forward to her wedding day, looks forward to that day. I had an opportunity just today to speak to a young couple in our church who have set their date and they wanted to talk to me a little bit about it and all. And, uh, and I've known this little girl, she's a woman, since she was a baby, since she was less than a, about a year old, I'd say. And um, she and I were talking and she happens to be very dear to me. And as we were talking, I said to her, she said, you know, well, we want you to, to marry us. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm already married, but I, I, I'll perform your ceremony if, you're, if that's what you'd like. And as we were talking, I looked at her and I said, you know, honey, I said, I have to tell you, you know you're like my daughter and you know that at your wedding, you know I'm gonna cry. And she says, oh, I already know that. She says, go ahead. And I said, I will. You know, and as I look at that, I, I can see that she is already in her, her victim uh, I mean, her fiancé, <laughs> uh, you know, he's, uh, they're looking forward already to that day. And many, many girls um, throughout their life begin to plan out their weddings, even when they're just little girls. They already begin to think who they want to be with them in their wedding, who's their maid of honor, who are going to be the, the, the girls who, who wear the ugliest dresses I've ever seen. Uh, you know, they, they begin to think of those things and they plan it out. I want to have these colors. I want to get married in this location. And everything is built around an event. But ultimately what happens is they begin to realize that everything is built upon a relationship. Uh, looking forward to be with that man that they have given their heart and their love to for the rest of their life. And, and they look forward to that, you see. And, and, and it's not something that if they're truly in love, they're not runaway brides. If they're truly in love, they're looking forward to the day. And as the day begins to approach, it counts down until the day comes that they finally are joined in matrimony and so that they can go out and start a life with this person that they're ter terribly in love with. And, and the anticipation is incredible until the moment that it is consummated. And that's what he's saying He's saying, listen, if you're in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to eagerly wait to see him. Peter said, though we have not seen him, yet you love him. There's this anticipation, this desire, this longing, this, this want to in your heart to be with him. Why? Because he loved you so much, he gave himself up for you. Now you simply want to give yourself completely over to him. And so we're awaiting him. We're longing for him and we're preparing to be with him. John said it like this in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every person who has this desire to be with him lives a separated life, a pure life, even as the Lord Jesus Christ is pure. I have met people who know a lot about Bible prophecy. They can speak to you concerning Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and various passages of Old Testament and New Testament prophecy. They can give you understanding concerning the rapture and rewards and, and uh, marriage supper of the Lamb and a variety of things like that. But they don't love people. They don't care for people. They're more interested in information than they are in transformation. They're more interested in, in things than they are about the one whom they are preparing to be with. I encourage you today, even as the writer here is saying, we must eagerly wait for him. He is going to appear the second time apart from sin for salvation. He doesn't come the second time to die for sin. That's already taken place. He comes now to rescue us to be with him. And as we look forward to that, we prepare ourselves to be with him, I live in a life that is pleasing to him.